I'm Ger Brufi from GE Healthcare, and I hope to tell you something about the importance of characterization for disease. Imagine a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer some 20 years ago. When she was diagnosed, she received a mastectomy, then chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Shotgun approach, full court press, but that was the standard of breast cancer treatment at the time. Now imagine a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer in the last couple of years. She will have had options. She may have had her tumor profiled to understand what drugs are gonna work best for her tumor. She may have been profiled to understand how aggressive her cancer is, whether it's likely to recur or not. She'll have had a chance to be treated the right way the first time. The options will be there for her and her family. This is the future of personalized medicine. These kind of elements are coming together in a way that's causing us to ask some fundamental questions about how disease is characterized and treated. What specifically do you need to know? When do you need to know it? And what difference does it make? When do you need to know that you've got breast cancer or Alzheimer's? When do you need to know that your tumor, tumor is aggressive? And what specifically does it mean for how your therapy will progress, what treatment you will get as an individual. And these ideas are now coming together into a whole new concept around personalized certainty. Knowing with a degree of accuracy, a degree of precision, a degree of certainty that's appropriate to the life and death decisions that are being made in the choice of the right treatment for the right individual. And knowing with that complexity is driving a whole new field of value creation. It's causing value propositions that really have been unimaginable until now. And that's what's really underpinning where personalized medicine is going. We're all different. Everyone knows this. Some people have blue eyes, some people have brown eyes, some people have dark hair, some people have light hair, some people like to eat healthy, some people less so. So what causes this? And again, most people know that it's largely down to your DNA. This is your blueprint. You have some three billion points of data in every cell in your body that underpins your preferences, your height, and a lot of the things that make you, you. But it also, to a large extent, describes how you might get ill and how you might get well. well excuse me. So given that we understand that everybody's different, how come we're content with a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to disease treatment? You wouldn't walk into a shoe shop and pick out the first pair of shoes that you might see, put them on your feet. They wouldn't fit. Shop assistant, if it's a good shop assistant, will measure your foot, direct you to the right pair of shoes, you'll make the purchase. You wouldn't walk into an optician, pick out a first pair of spectacles, put them on your face. Wouldn't work. you get an eye test. A prescription would be written, and the right pair of spectacles would be prescribed for you. Most diseases are considerably more complex than your eyesight and your foot size. So it stands to reason that when we configure the treatment for these diseases, we better have a good idea what's driving what's gone wrong at the level of complexity that's appropriate to the disease. Most people, when they think of diagnosis, think of it, at, if at all, as somewhat of a reductionist term, rather simple, rather binary. I'm well, I'm not well. But in the last number of years, Considerable advantages in the field of molecular biology and genetics and genomics, technologies such as DNA sequencing, polymerase chain reaction, protein analysis means that we understand disease at a deeper, more fundamental level that has ever been possible before. We're beginning to understand at a molecular level what makes us sick. Now, the really interesting thing is that these research tools, which kind of exist perhaps in the abstract, understanding what makes a disease, are now being transferred from the research lab to the clinic. So instead of understanding what makes a disease, we're now able to apply these powerful, sophisticated technology and understand what makes your disease. And this is making all the difference to how diseases are being characterized and to what treatment choices are being used to make people better. So you can see that that diagnostic term becomes quite a reductionist. It doesn't capture the complexity doesn't capture the interdependency between the various proteins, genes, and other elements that make, us, that make us unwell. Disease characterization is a growing field, and it's really driving some new thinking about how personalized medicine is to be affected. Let's go back to that lady with breast cancer again. 20 years ago, 
She was diagnosed, she suffered a mastectomy, she went on to get chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Perhaps only 20% of women are gonna to respond to chemotherapy, but we've no idea which 20% they are, so everybody gets it as a matter of consequence. You live with the side effects, you live with the costs. Now let's go forward a little bit. Let's look at breast cancer a little bit more closely. When you think of breast cancer, when you think of any cancer, you can start thinking of it as the most complex, the most interdependent wiring diagram you've ever seen in your life. These are the kinds of diagrams that scientists and biochemists use to describe signal transduction pathways. And this is only one of the pathways that may be um, relevant to breast cancer. These are the molecules, these are the proteins that convey messages between cells and inside cells. And increasingly, we understand how changes and defects in these molecules drive particular diseases. Now, it stands to reason that if we understand at a molecular level where the fault may lie, then that will direct us as to where we apply the therapy. And that's beginning now to come through in understanding these mechanisms of action. So you start to see a very hand-in-glove interaction between diagnostics and pharmaceuticals. In fact, what we're increasingly seeing is that cancers are being described more by their molecular biology than by their geography. It makes more sense to refer to a cancer as a KRAS or a BRAF than a breast cancer because this starts to describe what's gone wrong and it starts to describe where we're going to apply some therapy. The numbers here are staggering. Tens of billions of dollars are spent in the US every year on treating cancer. Now, if you're looking at bringing, say, a one-size-fits-all, perhaps to the top right of this diagram, to look at a particular molecule, and all the accumulation of damage is happening over, for example, to the bottom left of this cancer, then A, you're not doing the patient any good, but B, you're not doing the healthcare system any good. Billions of dollars are wasted in the US and other countries every year on, can on treatments that make literally no difference to how cancers are being treated. So in addition to being a benefit for patients, personalized medicine stands to realize some significant healthcare system efficiencies as well. So let's go back to that woman who was treated and who was diagnosed with cancer relatively recently. She may have had her tumor profile, and that profile may have said it's ER, PR, HER2. That'll be completely and immediately relevant to the first line of treatment that she will receive. She may get that tumor further characterized by tests such as Mammostrash, which will indicate how likely that treatment is to recur, whether she's going to need adjuvant chemotherapy or not. That could make all the difference to whether, for example, she goes, undergoes a grueling course of therapy, incurs the expense, her and her family incur the trauma, lose her hair. This woman is likely to have the options that will really make a difference to the proper, the appropriate, the personalized treatment of her cancer. That's going to make a difference, as I say, not just for patients, for payers, but it's also playing out in the pharma world as well. For pharma, the whole concept of targeted therapies needs to be considered a little bit. I mean, does it make sense, for example, to segment the patient population where only a percentage of patients will receive therapy, where otherwise perhaps everybody would? And there's some interesting stories in pharma at the very early stages of personalized medicine. There are stories such as the drug Eresa, for example, which is a drug against lung cancer. But at the time of the launch of Eresa, the mechanism of action wasn't fully understood. We now know it affects uh, and it will improve outcomes in patients who've got a particular mutation in their epidermal growth factor receptor. But that wasn't written into the patient cohort selected for clinical trials. It wasn't written into the label. And therefore, the potential for targeted therapy wasn't fully realized for a drug like Eresa. But things have changed hugely. In the last six months, there have been magnificent launches of drugs for melanoma and for lung cancer that really do take advantage of the paradigm of personalized medicine. For lung cancer in particular, a new drug targets just three to five percent of sufferers, but those patients respond magnificently. So this is the two sides of the same coin type of uh, paradigm here between diagnostics and pharma, choosing which patients to treat and then treating them effectively. But it doesn't just play out in the clinic. What we're now finding is that pharma are able to use these biomarker tools and take them back into drug development. You can choose what patients to include in clinical trials, and that's playing out in terms of decreased cost and decreased time and decreased risk for drug discovery and delivery. So we're getting medicines to the market more efficiently, more quickly than ever before. All very well 
as long as you're using tests to rule in medicines. But let's start thinking, what happens if you're using tests to rule out medicines? Remember, clinics, physicians, hospitals are generally paid for what they do, not for what they don't do. So this whole concept of personalized healthcare is making us think a little bit more. And even as we work our way through this, we need to ensure that all the incentives of the stakeholders in this piece are properly aligned to make sure that we, we do the right thing in all the right places. Because here's the thing. If you're going to use sophisticated tests to say what therapies should be given, or more importantly, what therapies should not be given to a patient, then you better be darn sure you're making the right call. Let's go back to those life and death decisions as well. These are life and death decisions. And this is where complexity starts to come into this whole thing that really underpins some of these new value propositions. You're going to want to make sure that that call is validated, that you're going to have carried out extensive, expansive clinical trials on statistically significant cohort that give you the confidence to make that call and say, this treatment will not do this patient any good. These are trials that are not dissimilar in scale to the trials that pharma are carrying out for drug discovery activities. You're going to want to make sure that that test is regulated, because this is what we trust government for. This is what we trust the FDA for. This is what we trust CE marking for. You're going to want to ensure that the provision of that test, the provision of that service, is commensurate with the degree of accuracy, precision, and compliance that's required in the developed world and other worlds in which we live. And you're going to want to make sure, if I've convinced you of the complexity of these types of technologies, you're going to want to make sure that these tests and the consequence of applying these tests are going to be interpreted by experts. And what we're finding is this new level and this new requirement of complexity is driving new concepts in value creation in the field. For those of you who follow the area, and if you've looked at recent acquisitions, look at some of the multiples for the acquisitions of companies such as Genoptics, Caris, Clariant. There's considerable interest in the M&A community out there in this type of interpretive diagnostics. Some people are likening it to the biotech boom in the 1990s. But why is that? Why is that value? Why is that value being seen by the marketplace? Well, let me take you through the difference between a puzzle and a mystery. People are familiar with puzzles. You do them on the back of the New York Times. You've got all the data you need to solve a puzzle. It's all on the page somewhere. It's not the case with a mystery. In a mystery, you may have some of the data. Some of the data, data may be contingent on future interpretation. You may have to use inference. You may have to use expertise. People who can solve mysteries are very, very, very valuable. Think of a great quarterback who reads a defense, sees something happening, changes a play at the line of scrimmage before the ball is snapped. Think of a hedge fund trader who sees a market move on her screen and makes a call. And think of the kind of decisions that oncologists and pathologists have to make on a daily basis as they see complex cancer cases unfolding before them. Wouldn't it be great if we could take some of the mystery out of some of the calls we've got to make in medicine? I told you about the human genome, three billion data points. For the longest time, we've been accumulating more data. It's only in recent years we've actually been accumulating more comprehension to understand what that data actually means for us. But what would you change? If I've convinced you by now that disease are complex, they need complex and careful interpretation, that's fine. But we can take this apart on a couple more dimensions. One of them is longitudinally. You can make a characterization call at many stages in a disease. Screening, risk, diagnosis, therapy monitoring. And different criteria apply at different areas. If you've ever spat in a vial and sent your sample off to 23andMe, you know something about predictive genomics. You may, for example, have a 5% increased chance of heart disease. What does that mean? Would you change how you live your life? Maybe you would. Maybe you'd do some more exercise. Maybe you'd eat more healthily. Those of you may be familiar with BRCA1, BRCA2 uh, by Myriad Genomics, Genetics. It allows women to understand if they've got a significantly increased risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And people do make choices based on those data. But what happens if the choice isn't apparent? What happens if the test tells you you might have Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease? Currently, there are no cures for Alzheimer's disease. There are drugs that affect the symptoms, but no drugs that fundamentally affect the disease. But we hope that's going to change soon. There are a number of companies out there in late phase clinical trials who are about to launch such drugs. But then who gets the drugs? NG Healthcare, in the next year, will file for a PET imaging agent that will show how beta amyloid will be deployed in the brain, maybe years 
before clinical symptoms occur. And this is important because beta amyloid does its damage early. By the time you see the cognitive decline in patients like this, the damage has been done. Is that going to affect your decision on how these things come together? Of course it will. Now you see the two sides of the same coin. You see the characterization and you see the treatment. If you can both spot the patients who are likely to develop Alzheimer's and treat that disease at an early level, then you're absolutely going to want to know as soon as you possibly can. For those of you who've got patients or relatives, friends with Alzheimer's, that's going to make all the difference. That's going to move you from helplessness to managed care and how this type of disease is treated. So what does it mean for the future of healthcare? I, I'm not a big poker player, but there are some analogies. The stakes can often be very high. The odds can change. And like most things in life, the more information you have, the better. Wouldn't it be good if you could see the cards in your opponent's hands? Now, we're not there with personalized healthcare. But every day, we're understanding more and more about the characterization of disease and what that means for its ultimate treatment. And that surely is a hand well worth playing. Thank you for your attention.